Hi, this is Dustin. I just wanted to come on real quick and discuss the launch weather for the SpaceX DM2 launch where Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley will be taken up to the International Space Station uh, by the SpaceX Dragon 2 capsule. Uh, they will get in the orbit aboard a Falcon 9 uh, SpaceX and their workhorse uh, rocket, which is incredible. Um, now, uh, diving in real quick, let's go ahead and look at some concerns uh, that that are, uh, are are noteworthy moving into this. And then I want to go through some of the weather models and uh, why I am cautiously optimistic that we will have a launch uh, tomorrow uh, at the time of recording. Again, this is the L1 update, L1 meaning uh, uh, launch minus one, meaning uh, the launch will be in about 24 hours or be the next day and this of course is May 26th 2020 um, so going through uh, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the concerns so number one the number one concern is thunderstorms in the area uh, as many know Florida has very unique weather and one item that is uh, uh, pretty much always a concern with an afternoon launch uh, during late May, June, July, August, September, and even early October, uh, in some cases, is those uh, those, that, those afternoon thunderstorms that pop up. Uh, usually there's a setup where you have what is called a sea breeze, which uh, brings in uh, moisture off, off the ocean and uh, allows for convection to rapidly take place. And this produces thunderstorms now typically one of those uh one typically there's a steering current that that pushes the storms that develop in one direction or the other on any given uh day when when uh, the storms will fire up and it, and it appears um that the steering currents uh, could potentially bring storms in the direction of cape canaveral and the kennedy space center so yes thunderstorms in the area is a concern um, another concern is, of course, uh, fly through precipitation. So uh, obviously the rocket can't fly through precipitation um, based on its launch commit criteria, which will launch weather commit criteria, which we'll look at in a few minutes. Um, so uh, not only that, but storms in the abort and recovery area um, and also surface winds before launch in the abort and recovery area. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. So let's quickly look through the uh, the 45th Space Wing Weather Squadron L1 forecast. So they are looking at a 40% probability of violation, meaning a 60% chance that we will have a launch from a from the perspective of the uh, launch area uh, weather commit criteria. Um, but if you look right here, there's additional risk. Um, upper level winds, which are uh, pretty problematic for SpaceX launch vehicles during the uh, the late fall, the winter, and the early spring, uh, when that when that jet stream tends to um, dip down further south, um, we we sometimes uh, can get into that jet stream and it causes an issue with upper level winds. We're not going to see that. I would give the probability of an upper level wind scrub at uh, close to zero. Um, it would it would take crazy, crazy, crazy events for that to be an issue. Booster recovery weather, though, that's something we're going to look at uh, heavily. This booster recovery weather, uh, we will look at that. Uh, on top of that, uh, not even pictured here, um, this mission also has to meet uh, a weather criteria, which is in respect to the, uh, the abort scenario. So um, one element that makes the SpaceX and Dragon system so safe is there is an opportunity for the astronauts to safely abort at any point during the launch. Um, so with that said, uh, it's super important that the weather is good um, in the very unlikely, you know, I would put it at, you know, uh, less than 0.5% uh, chance, but, you know, that even, even less than a 1% chance of an abort happening you must be prepared for that. You, you would not want to have a circumstance 
or the abort takes place, and then you put the astronauts in danger. So uh, sat, uh, Wednesday's weather looks pretty good. Tomorrow's weather, uh, May 27th, uh, looks pretty good. Um, when, uh, Saturday's weather, uh, which is the next day that they're looking at, um, which is uh, May 30th, uh, that also looks pretty good as well. Um, they are, uh, there's some similar uh, conditions if you look at either of these. Um, the big difference that I see is there is a moderate risk for booster recovery weather to cause a scrub. Um, there, but in the case of the, um, in case of the, uh, the second option day of Saturday, there is a low risk for booster recovery. In this specific video, we're not going to look at Saturday quite yet. Uh, we're hoping that it goes off on uh, May 27th. If you're watching this on launch day, uh, let's hope it goes and uh, let's take a look at weather. So this is the weather cr commit criteria. I want to dive through this super quick. Um, you know, essentially, uh, you don't want sustained winds of 30 miles per hour um, at the launch site. You, you don't want to go through upper level winds uh, that are out of constraints. Usually those are around 100 to 110 knots. Um, which is pretty fast. That's well over hurricane speed. Uh, do not launch in lightning. No brainer. Do not launch near a thunderstorm, a detached cloud head, uh, some other weather terms. Do not launch um, within five miles of clouds that extend into freezing temperatures. So that would be specifically those uh, cumulus clouds. Um, these cumulus clouds can even if they're not producing rain, even and even if they're not at that time producing thunder, uh, because of the dynamics of the rocket and how it moves through um, the sky and, and into into um, its trajectory, uh, there's always a chance that lightning can be produced. Uh, we found that out uh, looking historically at Apollo 12, I believe. Do not launch to a cloud layer great, uh, greater than uh, four to five hundred feet thick that extends into freezing temperatures. Um, do not launch within 10 nautical miles of a cumulus cloud top that extends into freezing temperatures. Again, going through this, it's kind of the same. Um, and uh, do not launch of downrange weather indicates violation limits at splashdown in the case of dragon launch escape. Um, do not launch uh, if downrange weather shows a high probability of violating limits at splashdown in the case of dragon launch escape. Again, high probability. So, uh, it's very possible that a moderate uh, or low probability of uh, causing an issue um, would be uh, commensurate of a go. Um, you know, again, the, there's there's a semantics involved with this uh, that we don't really know. We're not we're not on board with with SpaceX, and if you are on board with SpaceX, feel free to drop a comment. But even if you were, you may not be able to do that because of uh, NDA or because of um, proprietary information. So we understand that. So we're here left to speculate and look and get and take our best guess. Again, this is a test launch. Uh, we're going to learn a lot uh, from seeing how this progresses. We'll know a lot more by this time tomorrow, the time of recording and posting. Um, so uh, real quick, there's a note right here. So uh, downrange weather is monitored at more than 50 locations along the ascent track along the North American Eastern Seaboard and across the North Atlantic. Probability violation is calculated for each location, including uh, limit conditions for wind, waves, lightning, and precipitation. So uh, this gives us a guide for what we'll look at uh, moving forward through the rest of this uh, video. So again, let's look at launch site weather. Um, this is uh, the GFS uh, one hour average simulated uh, IR brightness temperature. Uh, this is basically looking at the cloud tops and uh, typically, the colder the tops are, the higher they are. Um, also, this gives us an indication of uh, what is freezing. Um, a lot of, you know, we were looking at earlier, uh, anything that goes into the freezing level, that would present a, uh, an issue. So um, anything that is white or gray, uh, especially this gray color, um, that is not a cause for concern. Any, any of these bigger, these blues, these greens, the yellows, all the way up here to the reds, that is a cause for concern. Um, and that is something we need to look at. So uh, starting at the launch site, we, it looks to be a pretty good day. Uh, again, we're looking at uh, 19 Zulu 
uh, which is around, uh, which is what I, I believe that to be 19 uh, UTC, which is, um, if I'm not mistaken, that would be seven, that'd be around three, 4 p.m. So about 3 p.m. So that's within a couple hours of launch. Um, the GFS operates on a, on a six hour basis. So you have a 19Z run and then you're going to have um, the next run will be, uh, I believe, a 1Z the following day. So 1Z Thursday. Anyway, so continue to go through this. You can see that we've superimposed the launch trajectory. So looking at this, um, in the immediate launch vicinity, uh, there's not significant clouds, but we have to watch uh, what is right here. Now, um, the good news is that the trends are uh, this specific element of clouds is weakening. Um, and we could potentially expect to see uh, that by the time launch comes, um, we will have uh, a scattered and broken uh, circumstance. Now, right here, if you look right here, this is booster recovery. And there is uh, clouds that, that the, the booster might have to fly through. Um, however, uh, you know, these clouds don't appear to be significantly thick. Um, even portions of this area may not even see precipitation or the precipitation would be scattered. So uh, moving through this, um, this is the precipitation. Again, um, there is a chance for precipitation uh, right here. Um, now, because this is a, this is a GFS is a long range uh, weather forecasting tool, um, you cannot look at a blob of precipitation on a on a forecast tool and project that there will be precipitation there at that time. All you can do is assign a given probability. And when I see greens, um, I see, when I see dark green, I, I, I see, a, a, of course, a lower probability for precipitation um, versus the areas that are in the yellows and in oranges. So looking right here, I see that there's a chance for precipitation in both the booster recovery area and in the launch site area. Moving forward into this, winds. Uh, winds are something that are very important, especially for recovery. Um, going through the entire eastern seaboard, the main area of concern would be this area in and around this low. Um, as you get closer to the Carolinas, um, you see a higher uh, wind, um, but believe it or not, the uh, Anything below, uh, I believe, 30 knots would be okay. And so the wind in this area um, of the booster recovery is between 20 and 25 knots, uh, which is pretty brisk, uh, but it's still uh, within range of what the crew that recovers the booster and the crew that would potentially recover and, and abort um, circumstance uh, can take. So um, I'm not too concerned about the winds, at least for the time of watch. So uh, let's look at a more uh, high resolution uh, weather model. This is the NAM. I'm, I'm a big proponent of the NAM. Um, at times the NAM is pretty aggressive uh, when it comes to, you know, it sees, okay, a storm might be there. Okay, we're going to make the biggest storm in the world and we're going to plop it right there. Uh, so the NAM is pretty aggressive, but it's also uh, pretty effective at giving um, a, a tighter uh, resolution, a higher resolution, I should say, of what we could be potentially looking at. So if you look right here, um, you see that we have scattered storms um, in and around central Florida. Uh, it appears to be much drier than was anticipated even a few days ago. So the fact that we see uh, mostly partly cloudy skies um, and then one or two or three scattered storms tells me that uh, we are looking at a much higher likelihood of a launch than we were even a few days ago, where it appeared the entire state would be covered uh, by rain, showers, and scattered storms. So moving forward and looking at precipitation, we can get an even better view that in the launch area, um, even the launch recovery area, the storms are very tiny. Um, the convective activity is isolated to, um, you know, well inland getting closer and away from the recovery area toward uh, North Carolina, even parts of South Carolina. Uh, there again will be scattered showers. That is something we'll have to watch. Uh, you know, I would not be surprised if 
you know, this, there is some sort of scrub that is, that a shower uh, in the area would be it. But again, the likelihood of that is uh, going down. Again, um, when you're looking at weather and you're looking at weather models, the most important item to look at is trends. Uh, looking at trends between one model to the other, um, you know, in this case, we're looking at the NAM, we're looking at the GFS, they're giving us a very similar picture. Uh, there is a there is a condition above central Florida uh, that appears to be a lot drier, and there is a condition along the flight path which appears to be drier than was originally expected, and that is certainly good news. So uh, this is how the NAM depicts the uh, the surface winds, um, even in respect to this low that appears to develop. Um, the surface winds are still nominal in the twenty to uh, I, I would even say 18 to 25 knot range, which should be nominal for a landing and also nominal for a splashdown. Um, not pictured here, uh, but if you look at the sea states, um, the sea states should be uh, nominal in this area as well. Uh, let's look at recovery weather. So the biggest uh, one item of concern that I have is uh, some models are actually trying to develop the low pressure system that will be in the Carolinas uh, by the time a uh, launch takes place. So we're right now we're looking at uh, a video um, animation of what the what the weather what this specific low pressure system is doing. And again, the NAM is fairly aggressive, but it would appear that it is trying to develop uh, some sort of tropical storm uh, forest conditions. Um, in the vicinity of booster recovery. Um, and again, this is taking place um, probably about uh, 18 to uh, you know, 12 to 18 hours away from launch. So there is a possibility that the recovery ships will have to move to a different location and come in uh, closer to launch. And so that'd be something we'll have to watch. And so, you know, there could, there could be a chance that if this storm here develops further, uh, we could potentially see uh, something. But the likelihood of that is still low. Um, even the likelihood of this storm developing in this way is low. So, you know, we can see this also from the precipitation standpoint. We can look at and see uh, some sort of organization take place around the circulation. Um, again, uh, as the storm progresses through, the core of moisture uh, tightens as well, and uh, we see less moisture over the booster recovery area. Um, and as it progresses, we see even drier conditions. Uh, this is good news because in previous models, uh, we saw a ton of thunderstorm action fire up. Um, even though the flow does appear to be from the southwest to the northeast, um, it, it does appear that showers are not popping up to the degree that we expected even yesterday. So um, again, speaking to different weather models, I want to look at the GFS and how the GFS uh, differs across its path. And so if we look at the different um, the different iterations of the GFS, we look at uh, you know zero Zulu um, Wednesday morning. Uh, we see that the booster recovery area is fine. You know you have about sixteen to twenty. Uh, not winds, and that's not bad. Uh, right here, it's in the brunt of it. This is a six Zulu or about 2 a.m. Eastern Standard, Eastern Daylight Time. Um, again, this is still nominal. Uh, it's still below 30 knots. Um, again, uh, about 10 hours before launch, uh, or about, about uh, I believe that would be around 6 a.m., 7 a.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. There is still some wind, but it is not substantial enough to merit a move. And then we're looking at 18 Zulu or you know, closer to launch around 3, 4 p.m. We can also see that the conditions are nominal for booster recovery and even for the recovery of astronauts in the case of abort. So now let's go ahead and look at the transatlantic Abort sites, if you look along that purple line, you can see that there is some cloud cover, uh, but thankfully um, along this line, we don't see any significant uh, yellows or 
um, oranges to indicate thunderstorm development or uh, higher tops that could present an issue for an aborting spacecraft. Um, it's also important to note that the abort, that there is uh, sort of a cutoff area, so you, you can abort anywhere along this line, and then there's also a cutoff right here uh, around this vicinity going through to uh, the area of Ireland and even getting closer to, to England. So um, without going into too much detail, the way that this works is uh, if, the, if the abort would, if, if an aborting spacecraft would put it in this area, the Dragon capsule would do a, a burn of its engines to bring it either in this vicinity or in this vicinity, um, you know, the vicinity closer to Ireland um, or the vicinity closer to uh, Eastern Canada. Anyway, uh, moving through this, we can also see that uh, there is light precipitation along this path, but the main area of concern for abort weather uh, would be in this general vicinity um, off the coast of the Carolinas. Looking at winds, um, anything blue uh, it is considered nominal for, for surface winds. Um, you know, darker blues create more of an area of concern than anything less than that. Um, is fine. If I, if I were to see greens, I'd be a little more concerned. But as you can see, uh, we are looking pretty good. So again, just to recap, um, I'm expecting a launch. Uh, if I had to put a percentage together, I would say that the percentage of violation at the, at the launch complex would be between 30 and 40 percent. Um, adding in the probability of violation along the path, uh, I would bump that up to about 50% uh, probability of violation if you include the abort and the booster recovery weather in that in that uh, in that compilation that calculation so again the primary concerns and I will I'll scroll uh, all the way back so we can go back to that slide so you can just get a visualization of the primary concerns um, again thunderstorms in the area, fly through precipitation, uh, storms in the abort recovery area, surface winds before launch in the abort recovery area. Again, these are our concerns. Um, I would definitely, uh, I would definitely look out for this launch. It's going to be awesome. Um, I really hope that you get the chance to see it, even if you can't be at the launch. Uh, definitely be on the lookout for this one. Um, again, uh, you know this is something that I'm trying, and I certainly hope that you would uh, continue to look out for, for these types of breakdowns and analyses on the weather. Um, again, uh, just to recap uh, my uh, opinion, again, I'm not a meteorologist. I'm not part of the 45th. I'm not from SpaceX, so there's a lot that I do not know. Um, I'm just really into this, and I uh, want to give content to those of you um, like myself who are interested in seeing this launch and want to know if it will launch. So again, I would put it at about a 30 to 40% chance of violation or a 70 to 60% chance of go um, at the launch area. And then adding into that a 50-50 um, in the launch recovery area. So with that said, again, I am Dustin. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Um, I will, I'll be out of here. Thanks.